Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Most of us get spam email every day, and we call it spam because it's not something we want. And supposedly, the term spam goes all the way back to that silly Monty Python skit at the restaurant where everyone's just chanting and singing annoyingly about spam. Well, today we're going to be looking at a biblical version of spam when the Lord overruns the Egyptians with a whole lot of stuff they don't want. But the purpose wasn't to annoy them or be funny or silly, but to show them the emptiness of their gods and the reality of himself. So welcome to the Key Chapters Podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, and it is an honor to go through God's Word with you. Today we're looking at Exodus chapter 8 and the plagues of the frogs, lice, and flies. Now, as we turn to Exodus chapter 8, the deliverance of God's people is underway. The Jews have been enslaved in Egypt now for over 400 years. God has raised up Moses to be their deliverer, and the beginning of their deliverance began yesterday in Exodus chapter 7, when the Lord turned water in the blood. Now, all of these plagues are incredibly dramatic, and the Lord has made it clear back in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, where he promised to deliver his people in a manner that would show them that he was the Lord and that they should be following him. In fact, we mentioned yesterday that these miracles are specifically set against the gods of the Egyptians to show the Jewish people that it is every bit in their best interest to worship and serve the Lord because He alone is God. Each miracle was supposed to show the Egyptians that they should let the Jews go, and they were to cause the Jews to ask the question, am I going to follow the Egyptian gods or the God who just defeated them? And that brings us to a key point that we didn't have time to get to yesterday, because here's the thing. These plagues were not just against the Egyptians, they were for the Jews. As in, after 400 years, the Jews were waffling in their obedience to the Lord. And so, before we dive into Exodus chapter 8, let's take a moment and turn to an important passage that gives us insight into the backstory of what's going on in this passage. So, turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 20. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Ezekiel 20 reveals some of the challenges that was going on in the heart of the people during these events. And so Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 5 to 8, shows us what's going on. And here the Lord says to the prophet Ezekiel, and he says, And say to them, Thus says the Lord God, On a day when I chose Israel and swore to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, when I swore to them, saying, I am the Lord your God, on that day I swore to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. I said to them, Cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes, and do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so right here we see that the Lord is explaining what was going on in these events. But then look at verse 8, because here's what it says. It says, But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them, to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. And so this tells us that not only were these plagues the Lord's assaults on the Egyptian gods, they were also intended to convince the Jews that they should be following him. And yet, deep in their hearts, even despite all these miracles, they were still wrestling with which God are they going to follow? And if that's the case, then why did God rescue these people in the first place? Why not just find someone else? Well, the Lord tells us back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 37. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 37 says, Because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power. So God saved the Jews because of his love for their forefathers and his promises to them, even though at this point they're still wrestling with which God will they follow. Now we ourselves still do this today. We read these passages in scripture and we know that we should call upon the Lord and believe in him and trust him. And yet it is so tempting and so alluring to believe the world and doubt the Lord. In their day, these early believers were tempted by these Egyptians. And the solution back then was for these Jews to recognize the reality of God's work despite the Egyptians' message of the contrary. And that's the same solution for us. These Egyptians would have seemed so sophisticated compared to the Jews. But God was real, and the Lord was confirming to them and to all of us that He can be trusted. Now, as we continue on, there's also a few more things we should say about the gods of these Egyptians. As we unpack the next several chapters, we're going to see that the Lord is demonstrating his supremacy over these other gods, but it's not like this is a battle. You're not going to see these gods retaliate in these passages because they're not real gods to begin with. These were just religious things that the Egyptians had made up to represent things that were important to them. We need to remember that in these ancient societies, when they said something was a god, 
It wasn't because they actually believed that thing was a god. Maybe some did. But for the most part, what they were saying was that these things symbolized the character of their so-called god, the character of the things that they valued. And so it wasn't like that they were just so into frogs or snakes or cats that they just bow down to worship them. They believed that these so-called gods were the source of these things, the source of health and the source of wealth and protection and guidance. And they thought that there was a kind of a pattern that if they did these certain things, these religious rituals and all that, that they would tend to get these things, wealth and power and protection and those kinds of things. And so they just kind of kept on doing it because it seemed to keep on working. And here's the thing. The Jews were falling into this rut. Even today, people fall into this rut. People think that health and wealth and prosperity come from the gods of our day, things like education and government, family status, romance, something else. Now, these things might have a contributing role to getting what we want, but the true source is the Lord. But if you were to tell people that God is the source of these things, many people be adamant that he's not. They'll point to all these other sources like school, government, and social media, all these other things, and how they keep on doing these things and they get what they want. Well, really, these are just sophisticated upgrades to the Egyptians who were certain that things like health and prosperity came from their gods because it seemed to work. And all this now ties into the plagues. Because as we go through the next few chapters, we're going to see that the Lord just kind of shuts this off. He shows that he himself is the one who controls these blessings that we receive, not some other God, not some other source. And when we want these things the Lord's way or the way that truly matters, we need to seek them from him by being rightly aligned to him. And so let's take these principles and read chapter 8 in light of them, starting here now in verse 1. And so going on, after the events of chapter 7, where the Lord turned the water into blood, In chapter 8, the Lord sends Moses back to Pharaoh, and in verse 2, Moses warns Pharaoh, saying, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, but if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. Now, we might think that these frogs were to gross them out, because who wants land covered in frogs? I sure wouldn't. But that wasn't the purpose of this. God wasn't trying to gross people out. He was showing that only he is real and these other gods are not. And so right away, we need to understand that there was a goddess who was represented by frogs, and her name was Heket. And she was the goddess of fertility, which was a big deal back then because fertility represented abundance and wealth and prosperity. And so the idea was that frogs symbolized the fruitfulness that was found in her, the abundance that was found in her, kind of like how rabbits are symbols of fertility today. And so when the Lord tells Pharaoh to let his people go, he's saying, I'll cover the land with fertility. Like, you want fertility? I'll show you fertility. And so Pharaoh kind of blows them off. And the Lord uses Moses and Aaron to then bring out frogs. And pretty soon, frogs cover the land. But then in verse 7, the magicians are able to do the same thing. Probably because, again, you have this very popular goddess of fertility. And they probably had buckets of frogs lying around. And so they just kind of spread them around too. Like, hey, you know what? You want frogs? You want fertility? We can show you how to do that also. And they just spread these frogs around. But here's the thing. It's one thing to pour out buckets of frogs. It's another thing to clean up a bunch of slimy hopping critters. And they can't clean them up. And so in verse 8, Pharaoh recognizes that the Lord has beat their goddess Hecate. And he asked Moses to get rid of the frogs. Moses says in verse 9, I'll tell you what, you have the honor of deciding when they go. Pharaoh says, tomorrow. And in verse 10, they agree. And the next day, in verses 13 and 14, the frogs start keeling over. And you've got these frogs everywhere, now just dead. And so these little guys were supposed to be symbols of abundance and life. And now they're just abundance and death. And it's just piling up in the streets. And they're rotting and becoming foul. And and piles of living frogs is gross. But piles of dead frogs, that's grosser than gross. So in all of this, the Lord demonstrates his power over this Egyptian god, Hecate. Now, you'd think this would convince Pharaoh, but it doesn't. And so in verse 15, Pharaoh hardens his heart. He does not let the Jews go and worship the Lord. And so the next plague that comes on Egypt is the plague of the gnats. And in verse 16, Aaron strikes the ground, gnats come up. And here's we need to know that there was also a god of the ground named Geb or, or Seb, depending on how you pronounce it. And so Aaron, when he strikes the ground, he produces these swarms of gnats, and he's showing that the Lord even rules the ground. I remember when I was a kid going to the beach in New Jersey. We had some friends who were visiting us. We went to the beach in the evening time, and all of a sudden we're at this beach. All of a sudden these gnats just start swarming around us. And it was so thick and so bad we ran back to our car, but they actually got into the car with us. The car was like filled with these gnats. We drove home. They're biting us the whole time. We run into our house and they follow us into the house. And I still remember this. We, we, we finally are saved because we go into the kitchen and they all swarm around the, the ceiling light in the kitchen. And I remember watching them and just remembering how miserable it was. And, and so I can only imagine what it was like for these Egyptian folks to be here with all these gnats swarming around and no kitchen lights to save them. And so you've got these gnats. They're swarming around. 
And in verse 18, the magicians, they try to do something similar. They can't. And so in verse 19, they say, this is the finger of God. And again, the Lord has defeated another Egyptian god. But Pharaoh was still hard-hearted in verse 19. And then comes the flies. The plague of the flies shows the Lord's power and victory over the god Capri. Now, Capri was represented with the face of a bug, and he was the god of creation and rebirth and the rising of the sun. These were really important themes of the Egyptians. And to remind themselves of these themes, many people even had jewelry with bugs on them, representing the god Capri and the order he provides, the life he provides, the daily cycle of life he provides. And so the Lord's power over flies demonstrates God's power over even Capri. Now, at this point in verse 25, Pharaoh seems pretty impressed with all this power of the Lord. And so he says he'll allow Moses to take the Jews and go out and sacrifice. He just won't allow them to leave Egypt. But then in verse 26, Moses explains that's not good enough because their sacrifices might offend the Egyptians. And so Pharaoh agrees to let them go, just not very far. Well, Moses leaves there and keeps his end of the bargain. And in verse 30, Moses prays the Lord. In verse 31, the Lord completely removes every fly so that not one remain, not a single one. Like, normally there's some flies around, but there was none at this point. And I'd imagine for a few days, it was probably really nice being in Egypt without any flies anywhere. But despite this blessing and despite this demonstration of God's power, in verse 32, Pharaoh once again hardens his heart. We're going to see that things just get worse and worse for Pharaoh, and the Lord will eventually break Pharaoh's will and really bring destruction to Egypt, which then allows the Jews to finally be delivered. So that's Exodus chapter 8. And as we wrap up our study in this chapter, these plagues give us an example of what it looks like when people reject God's warnings. The Lord gives us so many warnings about worshiping any other God beside him or pursuing things that are unholy in their nature or living for ourselves and not by his purposes. And when people hear these warnings, they're like, well, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, kind of like Pharaoh here. Pharaoh hears these warnings and he can't imagine how bad can it be to have flies flying around. And we have flies all the time or or frogs. They're kind of cute, you know, big deal. And so Pharaoh hears these warnings. He blows them off and he suffers the consequences. And people do the same thing today. They hear of God's warnings, but we can't comprehend what his judgment is like. You know, we're like, well, I'll hang out with my friends or I'll sit around and be drinking iced tea or something like that. And we hear that judgment is coming. We figure, well, since, since it, I can't imagine it being that bad, it must not be that bad. But here we're seeing that when God gives us a warning, we must take heed and pay attention, respond appropriately because God's not playing games. This isn't spam. This isn't funny. This is God being serious about who he is and us being rightly aligned to him. And so there's a lot more to be said about plagues and and Pharaoh's heart. We're going to be talking about those more over the next couple of days as we keep on digging into these chapters here. And so with that, thanks so much for listening. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Until tomorrow, God bless.